be split up into different Sunday school classes now. And we can get started here. Um, the live stream of the ordination service seemed like it was mostly successful, not too many glitches or problems, so we're trying again with Sunday school this morning and see if I can figure out why. When everybody put out their right hand, it looked like they were holding out their left hand. We'll see if we can avoid that um, for right now. Uh, okay, we are in the Belgic Confession, Article 18. Belgic Confession, Article 18. The Incarnation of Jesus Christ. And this could go one of two ways. We could get through it very quickly and easily, or we could be parked here until Christmas time. Is so, it all up to us? <laughs> it, to some extent, it is up to you, yes. We'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, now, one of the disadvantages of the green copy of the Three Forms of Unity, as opposed to the newer red copy of the Three Forms of Unity, is that in this one you don't have the scripture references listed, whereas in the red you do. And this particular article is really almost word for word just a tissue, a fabric of scriptural quotations and allusions. So I went through and I found um, a number that are not even listed in the red one as well that we can put in here. So that will be part of what slows us down or we keep motoring along quickly if we look at the texts individually. Okay, Article 18. We're coming here to God's purpose, which was set out in eternal election. And then God's promise was set out in Article 17 on the recovery of fallen man or perhaps more... more descriptively of the beginning of the preaching of the gospel. And now in Article 18, you come to God's purpose being carried out and God's promises being fulfilled. And that's why it begins in this way. We confess, therefore, that God has fulfilled the promise which he made to the fathers by the mouth of his holy prophets. When he sent into the world, at the time appointed by him, his own only begotten and eternal Son, who took upon him the form of a servant and became like unto man, really assuming the true human nature with all its infirmities and accepted. Being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without the means of man, and did not only assume human nature as to the body, but also a true human soul, that he might be a real man. For since the soul was lost as well as the body, it was necessary that he should take both upon him to save both. Therefore, we confess, in opposition to the heresy of the Anabaptists, who deny that Christ assumed human flesh of his mother, that Christ partook of the flesh and blood of the children, that he is a fruit of the loins of David after the flesh, born of the seed of David according to the flesh, a fruit of the womb of Mary, born of a woman, a branch of David, a shoot of the root of Jesse, sprung from the tribe of Judah, descended from the Jews according to the flesh, of the seed of Abraham, since he took on him the seed of Abraham and was made like unto his brethren in all things, sin accepted. So that in truth he is our Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us. Now in that really wonderful confession, there's, I think, three things of primary interest or three things that maybe require more explanation than other things. Um, one is just the basic heart of the matter, that the Lord Jesus became man. His only begotten and eternal Son was made a human being, a true human nature, body and soul. Um, the second thing that is particularly requiring or deserving of explanation is the confession's insistence that he had a human soul as well as a human body. And the third thing, of course, is the rejection of the heresy of the Anabaptists. So with regard to the first point, the question of the incarnation of God the Son, 
The confession starts out by saying that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. And they're drawing this language from Luke chapter 1, where Simeon particularly confesses this truth. Wait, I'm sorry, not Simeon, where Hannah and Mary confess this truth. Sorry about that. Um, Simeon is in chapter 2. And he sent into the world, at the time appointed by him, his own only begotten and eternal Son. So the very first thing to, to pay attention to is who are we talking about here? Who is the subject of this? Well, it speaks of him in terms of God's own only begotten and eternal Son. In other words, we're talking about an action that is distinctive of the second person of the Trinity. Now, we've talked about this before, that all of God's external works are undivided. Whether you're talking about creation, whether you're talking about new creation, it's true to say that God did it, and you can say the Father did it, the Son did it, the Holy Spirit did it. And that's all true. And yet, there are works that are personally appropriated in a particular way. And the Incarnation is perhaps the clearest example of that. Because this was the fulfillment of God's purpose and the completion of his promise. We're told, of course, in scripture that it was by the power of the Holy Spirit that Mary conceived. But the Father was not incarnate. The Spirit was not incarnate. Only the Son was incarnate. And so this work with regard to its Termination with regard to which person of the Trinity was particularly involved in it, you can see that it's appropriated to the Son in a way that is not applicable to the Father or to the Spirit. That's why the doctrine of incarnation is one of the doctrines that you can only understand and appreciate if you understand the doctrine of the Trinity. If you're some sort of Unitarian, if you're some sort of modalist, who thinks that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just three different names for the same person, three different phases through which God passes, then incarnation makes no sense. You'd have the entirety of the Godhead being incarnated, Father as well as Spirit, and you could speak of the Spirit suffering and the Father rising from the dead, things which Scripture never, ever says. So in order to understand the incarnation, we have to understand the Trinity. But we're not going to go back over all the same ground we've already covered in a fair amount of detail in previous weeks. Okay, so far, questions, comments, concerns? So it's only God the Son who is incarnate. He is the subject of this. Now, what does that mean? Well, he took upon him the form of a servant and became like unto man. And now they're going to explain what that quote from Philippians 2, 7 means. Really assuming the true human nature with all its infirmities, sin accepted, being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without the means of man. So what does it mean that he became incarnate it means that he assumed, he took to himself the true human nature. Not something that was similar to humanity, not something that was close to humanity, genuine humanity. Genuine humanity with its limitations and weaknesses. Not a super humanity, not a humanity that was not subject to pain, and suffering and fear, but a real humanity. Can that word be used in, in another way? Which word is that? Incarnation. Incarnation? Well, sometimes people will say incarnation when they mean that something expresses something particularly well. You might say, oh, he's the incarnation of kindness, meaning that he's very kind and you see kindness in all of his actions. Um, you could also use the word embodiment for that. You know, he embodies what it means to be a gracious individual. 
But strictly speaking, of course, in terms of assuming a nature that did not originally belong to you, well, there's only one incarnation. Strictly speaking. Now, obviously, you know, people use words figuratively, but strictly speaking, Christ, the God, the Son, already an existing personal subject with his own nature, the divine nature, added a second nature, the human nature. Now, we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail, Lord willing, in Article 19. So I don't want to get into all those questions just now, because we'll get into them all again in Article 19. But it was a genuine human nature which was fully, entirely assumed. And then that phrase, being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without the means of man, that tells you how it happened. So really assuming the true human nature with all its infirmities, sin accepted, that tells you what happened. What is incarnation? The next bit tells you how it happened. What was the mechanism by which this assumption was accomplished being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without the means of man. Let's take that in reverse order in order to be clear on this point, hopefully. Without the means of man, this was miraculous, this was supernatural, this was not an ordinary birth, this was not an ordinary conception because this was not an ordinary person. This had never happened before, and it has never happened again. God the Son became incarnate exactly once. And nobody else becomes incarnate in the sense, the strict theological sense that we mean here. So, this happened, this miracle happened by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's very clear when Mary herself has questions about it. She's like, well, how's that going to work? And the angel explains that God's omnipotent power, specifically exercised by the Holy Spirit, will come upon her, will overshadow her. What did Mary contribute? Well, Mary contributed whatever a woman normally contributes to the birth of a child. She contributed her genetic materials. But the Holy Spirit made that be enough as God the Son assumed that human nature from Mary into personal union with himself. So there's errors on many sides here, and, and most of them will come up in Article 19. So I'm just going to be very quick about this. We don't want to say that after the Incarnation there were two persons. There were not two persons. There was the one person, God the Son. But we don't want to say there was only one nature, either just the divine or just the human or some weird hybrid of both of them. There were two natures, one person. Is that hard to wrap your mind around? Well, sure. God is entering humanity. God is becoming a human being in his own person, in the person of God the Son. That's not going to be easy. That's not going to be thoroughly straightforward. But it's, I mean, this article, of all the articles in the Belgian Confession, this one is just saturated in scripture quotations <laughs> and allusions. It's very clearly the teaching of scripture here. So we have that this was in fulfillment of God's promise and purpose. We have what happened. We have how it happened. Up until now, any questions? Any clarifications? Anything to add? Yes, Julia. I just want to know, I mean, it says Virgin Mary. Afterward, she still was the Virgin Mary, right? Well, you know, that is one of the points that has been disputed, and there's actually been kind of a shift of opinion on that. For instance, the early reformers like Luther and Calvin um, actually did hold that she remained a virgin for the entirety of her life. Later, um, the Reformed theologians began to use the idea that she had not remained a virgin the entirety of her life as part of a polemic against a Roman Catholic view of marriage, which seemed to degrade the sacredness of marriage. All of that to say, within the Reformed world, 
Today, you will not find very many people who believe that she remained a virgin forever. Most people will put a certain amount of emphasis on the fact that Joseph did not know her until the child was born, and then assume that the marriage progressed as normal after that point. I, I can certainly appreciate that. I can understand that. Um, it used to be that theolo Reformed theologians would make the argument that the marriage was distinctive and that Mary's virginity was preserved just to make absolutely clear there was no room for any doubts or questions or scruples about any of this and also something she might have done as a sort of a sort of a spin-off of the Nazarite vow. I don't think you can prove that. It's not a biblical doctrine. It is at best a traditional idea. It's a traditional idea that a lot of our theologians have adopted, as I say, in the past, but today, not so much. However, we still refer to her as the Virgin Mary, not because we're dogmatically asserting that she was always and only ever a virgin, but because that was her condition, that was the distinctive thing about her when she gave birth to her firstborn son. And there's all kinds of questions about you know, Jesus' brothers and how do you understand that and so forth. Um, it's a very interesting discussion, but <laughs> it would take us the rest of the time here to wrap that up. Um, okay, very good. Anything else? Okay. So now we come to the second point I said we maybe need to explain particularly in this article, which is why did they put so much emphasis on the fact that he did not only assume human nature as to the body, but also a true human soul, that he might be a real man. For since the soul was lost as well as the body, it was necessary that he should take both upon him to save both. Maybe you're thinking, well, duh, of course he took upon him a true human nature that would be body and soul. But that has not always been clear to everybody in history. And in fact, there was a, a fellow named Apollinarius, and he had been a big opponent of the arch-heretic Arius who denied the deity of Christ. And Apollinarius resisted him and stood for orthodoxy, but Apollinarius himself went on to make a mistake. Now, his mistakes were, were very complicated and very hard to explain, but the way that it's usually boiled down with regard to the doctrine of Christ was this. He divided man into three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And he said that Jesus did not have a true human spirit. Instead, God the Son, the Word, took the place of the human spirit in Christ. He thought in this way he could preserve the true divinity of Christ and also explain how divinity and humanity related. But he made a couple of mistakes there. One is he made the trichotomous mistake of dividing man into three parts. But that's not the bigger deal because many people have done that and there's a way to nuance that where it kind of makes sense. And there are a couple of texts that speak of soul and spirit as being distinct. However, most of the reforms have been dichotomists. We believe man is composed of a material part and an immaterial part. And then soul and spirit, if they're distinguished, are just different ways of considering that same immaterial part. However, we're not going to get into that either today. This is why I said we can stay here till Christmas, because this is a lot of stuff to deal with. Okay. But the bigger mistake was that when he said human beings have body, soul, and spirit, Jesus did not have a regular human spirit. He had the Logos instead. At that point, he undermined the genuine humanity of Christ. And so his opponents, um, three of his principal opponents were the Cappadocian theologians, as they're known, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzen, and Basil of Caesarea. And Gregory Nazianzen specifically insisted again and again that what was not assumed was not saved. And that is a theological principle that the confession articulates. Whatever of human nature Jesus did not assume, 
that part, element, aspect of human nature, Jesus did not save. So if the old Docetists had been right, who taught that Jesus had the appearance of a body but not the reality, if they had been right, then our bodies would not be saved. If Apollinarius had been right, our spirits would not be saved. Because Jesus had to assume the very human nature which had sinned in its integrity, in its totality, in order to bring a total, an integral salvation to us. That's why the confession insists on that. They don't mention his name, but Apollinarius is lurking in the background there. And his mistake is being rejected completely. And that's what the Anabaptists No, the Anabaptists are going to have a view that's a little bit different than that. Um, we'll come to that next. But are there people walking around with that view too? I don't know that there's any groups that would officially admit to that view. I think it's the kind of thing some people, you know, they're trying to think about this, they're trying to figure out how it works, and they kind of casually fall into it. But it's, as far as I know, there's no Apollinarian movement anymore. Yes, sir? No, it seems to me today there's almost the opposite views around. We're going to save men's souls mm -hmm. in evangelism. Mm -hmm. Or people, you know, say, well, yeah, there's going to be a resurrection on the last day, but it's going to be a spiritual resurrection. It's almost like the body has no meaning right. today. Right. Yes, in some ways, our, you know, the situation we're facing is more like docetism, um, where Jesus' body wasn't real. That didn't matter. What really mattered was people's insides, people's spiritual aspect. You do run into some of that today. Um, for sure, and probably more often than you run into Apollinarianism. Okay, any other questions, comments? If somebody wants more information on mm -hmm. the body part of that, mm -hmm. um, might be interested to read what the Synod is going to discuss in the committee that, on Christian burial. Ah, uh, yes. It's well, kind of involved in that. You know, there is a very important place for the body in Christian theology and in Christian practice. Um, Paul is very specific that corporately, bodily, physically, we are temple of the Holy Spirit. So that certainly does have an implication for how do we treat the body? How do we regard the body? What do we do with the body? But against people who sometimes overemphasize that, it's good to remember that in the same book, writing to the same people, Paul also emphasizes that God made the belly for food and food for the belly, and then he goes on to say, and God shall destroy both it and them. The body is going to be destroyed and refashioned, remade. And if we lose that element, you lose something of the radical break, the discontinuity between life now and the life of the age to come. So, you know, there's something to be said on both sides of there. Okay, any other questions or comments about this part? All right, well then let's move on to the Anabaptists. Now, Debray, the author of the Confession, actually wrote a whole book against the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists flourish in Holland in many ways, and so people who were working in that area were particularly concerned to fight against them. But all of the reformers had to contend with the Anabaptists, and there's always that difficulty. You know, you start a reformation, and from your point of view anyway, there's a lunatic fringe. And the lunatic fringe gives you a bad name. So you're forced to fight against them on principle. You're forced to fight against them because they're wrong, but you're also forced to fight against them in a practical way. You need the Roman Catholics on the one hand and also kings and princes and magistrates to understand this is not who we are. That's not us. They may say some of the same things we do, they may do some of the same things we do, but we are not them. Please don't confuse us. And so the confession here 
opposes the heresy of the Anabaptists. Now, the Anabaptists were a diverse and disparate group. Not all of them held to the same point on everything, but Minocinus, one of them, was opposed to the true incarnation of Christ. And some of them taught something along the lines that Christ passed through Mary as water passes through a tube. Well, if water flows through a glass tube, you hope when you drink the water, you're not drinking little pieces of glass. You hope that the glass, or the, the, the water, I'm sorry, was uncontaminated by the vessel it flowed through. And that's what they were trying to say about Jesus. He entered the world through Mary, but without being contaminated by contact with her. Well, of course, that would mean he wasn't truly human. That would mean that Mary's involvement it might as well have been anybody. She contributed nothing. And that's why you have this whole string of quotations here talking about how he partook of the same flesh and blood that the children, the chosen children, partook of. That he's a fruit of the loins of David. That he is genetically related to David. And he's born of David's seed according to the flesh that he's genuinely the fruit of Mary's womb, truly born of a woman, again emphasizing a branch of David, a shoot of the root of Jesse, David's father, sprung from the tribe of Judah, descended from the Jews according to the flesh, of the seed of Abraham, since he took on him, the seed of Abraham was made like unto his brethren in all things, sin accepted. They're emphasizing then that Jesus is so truly human, that he has family, he has relatives, he has ancestors. If you were able to do a DNA analysis of the Lord Jesus and of King David and of the people in between, you would see they're coming from the same stock. They're clearly related. They have similar family characteristics. That's how genuine the incarnation was. And if it wasn't that genuine, if that's not what it accomplished, then calling Jesus God with us would just be a lie. He wouldn't really be with us. He wouldn't be one of us. And so in that wonderful term that Matthew picks up from Isaiah, you have the basic truth of this doctrine in one word. God the Son is with us one of us sharing our nature not sharing our sin if he shared our sin he wouldn't have been able to be our savior but sharing everything that properly belongs to humanity as i said before including our weaknesses our limitations and so you see christ learning new things you see christ getting taller you see christ growing in wisdom you see christ expressing disappointment you see him expressing fear. You see him overcome with horror in the garden of Gethsemane to the point that an angel had to come and strengthen him. You see him falling asleep after a long day of teaching. You see him wanting to get away from the crowds. You see genuine humanity. And in all of that that you see, you are looking at your God. He's your God in human flesh, in human body and soul. Sometimes when you say flesh, people think you're only talking about the body, but of course we mean human nature in its totality, even in its weakness, just with reference to Christ, not in regard to its sin. Okay, questions? Comments? Was that too fast? Do we have more to say on this subject? Okay, well, um, we'll have a break on Sunday school for the next couple of weeks, so we'll plan on coming back to Article 19 um, in April, unless I get questions offline about Article 18, something that makes me think we did not quite cover it adequately. If there's no further comments, then let's close the word. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for your goodness and your kindness to us. Thank you for the wonderful truth of the incarnation of Christ, for that unspeakable condescension in the only begotten and eternal Son of God taking to himself a true human nature. 
going through all the stages of human development, experiencing the weakness and the sorrows of human life, and indeed dying under the weight of our sin, experiencing the punishment due to sinful man. Father, we pray that the truth of God with us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ would sustain and uphold us, that we would know in every difficulty, in every sorrow and persecution, that he is with us and for us and will never forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are study guides for Esther on the back table if you haven't collected one yet.